Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. I know it's not a pleasure when the dean actually reads to you from the catalog, but I'm going to do that anyway and just uh, give me your patience. I am reading from the catalog. It says DTS competencies. Sometimes we don't think about these, but let me read it to you. It says, the curriculum and related seminary experiences are designed to help DTS students develop competencies of knowledge, abilities, and skills, and beliefs and values to help evangelize the world and build the church. Specific competencies are developed in each professional degree program, but all master's level DTS students are to develop competency in biblical interpretation, theology, communication, Christian spirituality, servant leadership, and last but certainly not least, cultural engagement. One of the ways that we want to address cultural engagement throughout this year has come about through the appointment of Dr. Daryl Bach as the executive director of the Center for Cultural Engagement. And he is in many ways leading a charge for us on the campus to help us address certain areas in culture that we as students of the Word need to be addressing and thinking about. We have specific chapels this semester, and this is the first one, where we are addressing certain topics. And we are thrilled today to have with us Dr. Stan Jones, who is the Provost and Professor of Psychology at Wheaton College. I would like to introduce him. Stan Jones has been Provost of Wheaton College for over 17 years. Before his appointment of Provost in 1996, he was Research Professor of Psychology and Christianity and Chairperson of the Wheaton College Psychology Department. He's been a research fellow of the Pew Evangelical Scholars Program and visiting scholar at the University of Chicago and Cambridge University. He's published widely on the general topics of relationship of psychological theory and Christian theology, Christian appraisal of psychotherapy theories, and on topics related to human sexuality and Christian faith. His work on sexuality has been concentrated on sexual education in the Christian family across the lifespan and on the challenging issue of homosexuality in the church. Would you please join me in welcoming and thanking Dr. Stan Jones for being with us today. And let's start, let's start with a word of prayer as we begin. Lord, thank you for today, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to come together. I ask that you would be with our speakers and those that present all of the questions. Father, help our hearts, help the tone to be pre presented in the right way. What a great challenge it is in front of us to live Christianly in a very dark culture. And help us today to learn to grasp your word in a whole new way and help our hearts to be in tune with you. And we pray all of this and present it to you through the only means and access that we have, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Dr. Bach. Thank you. Well, as our dean just mentioned, this is part of a new initiative in the seminary. This is the first cultural engagement chapel at Dallas Theological Seminary in the history of the school. So, um, and we start off with a simple topic, homosexuality. But before we get there, <laughs> before we get there, uh, I just want to uh, bring to your attention a couple of other things that we'll be doing this month. Uh, the first is already been noted, Kirby Anderson will be here next week to talk about cultural engagement and the media. Uh, we'll be doing a podcast as we did with Stan. We were in the studio for an hour uh, doing a video stream that's going to become part of a weekly release that we will be doing uh, once we get enough of them done to have enough to release. So uh, that you can keep your eyes open for that. And then on September 17th, the Center for Christian Leadership uh, in which cultural engagement is a part, will be hosting uh, Recovering Our Creative Crawling with Andy Crouch. And that will be an all-day event on Monday, uh, the 17th of September, here at the seminary from 8.45 to 3.30. And Andy will be doing several sessions. And then at the end, uh, I will interview him and interact with him on what it is that he's presented. We'll have a conversation about how to be a Christian and impact culture and how to think about cultural impact and having cultural impact as a Christian. So that's going to be a terrific event and students get a special deal. 
Uh, for $25, you can be there all day and, and get the full interaction. I ran across a student who heard Andy uh, at his church uh, last year, and he caught me and said, hey, Dr. Bach, I just want to tell you I heard Andy Crouch last year, and he was awesome. Now, I tend to think that awesome is an overused word these days, but uh, he really meant it. So, uh, so come to the awesome uh, seminar that we're going to have on cultural engagement in a couple of weeks. So with that as a kind of an announcement, uh, the way this is gonna work is Stan has prepared uh, something he's gonna say to everybody and you have it, the outline of it in your handouts. And then there's gonna be enough time for a handful of questions before our time runs out. And then we're gonna take a five minute break and let the people who need to move out, move out of here. And then the brown bag will continue in here afterwards and we'll just keep taking questions. So without any further delay, I do want to introduce to you Dr. Stan Jones, who is uh, well equipped to deal with this topic. When I announced to the faculty that Stan was coming to address this topic, I got an email from one of the faculty who works in the counseling department who said to me, you could not have picked a better person to do this with. So Stan, with that really inauspicious introduction, <laughs> The floor is yours. You didn't use the word awesome, Mark Darrow. <laughs> <laughs> I want to apologize ahead of time to, to your homiletics professor for probably violating every sacred rule, but in order to stay on track and to, to be efficient, I'm going to, I'm going to read my comments for about 15 to 18 minutes, and then hopefully that will open up a wide array of things that we can talk about. I'm really looking forward to the dialogue with you. The homosexuality issue is not about them. It's about you and me. One of my friends is a man who several decades ago sat in this very, uh, very audience as a DTS student. He's still a dedicated student of the Bible and a dedicated believer. His lifelong homosexual attractions have never been altered or healed despite fervent prayer to that end. He has struggled mightily but imperfectly to maintain sexual purity and he's, he has sacrificed much in following Christ as a chaste single man. He is far from perfect, but his tenacity and his sacrificial obedience inspires me. And I want to tell you that he has not been served well by the evangelical church. There are some like my friend, no doubt, who are sitting in this audience right now. And my hope is for them and for us that you will be able to do better than my generation has done in handling this issue. I've been a participant in the sexuality conflicts around homosexuality for almost three decades. I was drafted into this debate reluctantly and I wish desperately that I had been asked to speak here because I was known as a man of exemplary Christian virtue or because of the breadth of my Bible knowledge or perhaps even because I was irresistible eye candy. But instead, <laughs> instead I'm here because of my plotting involvement in the homosexuality battles of the church and of the culture from which I've learned a number of hard lessons. Uh, lessons that I want to share with you about some of the core failures that I believe continue to compromise the witness and hobble the ministry effectiveness of the evangelical church. And I hope to point to some of the way for you, the next generation of church leaders, to learn from the failures of my generation and to handle these matters with greater success. Fortunately, our God is not surprised when we fail miserably. In fact, our God is in the business of turning failure into triumphant success. He is the God who turns darkness into light, who turns tragedy into triumph, indeed, who turns death into life. And I challenge you to follow the highest possible standards as you engage these crucial cultural issues that confront the church and the world. So first, the evangelical church has failed by treating homosexual persons, gay men and lesbian women, first and foremost as our bitter enemies in a cultural war. When we position ourselves this way, our main and primary message becomes one of being naysayers, the ones who say no to that which the world is embracing with a triumphant yes. But our, if you stop to think about it, our God is a God of yes. But God's yes in the area of sexuality is not a yes of license, of chaos and dissipation. Our God is a gracious gift giver and our human sexuality is a profound good. I stand upon the historic teachings of the Christian church which has always understood the revealed will of God in the Bible to be that the full sexual intimacy is something that is to be reserved for, between one man and one woman to experience within the bounds of holy matrimony over a lifetime. God's no to homosexual intimacy is expressed in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Romans, 1 Corinthians, other places. But this no should neither be the starting point nor the ending point of discussion, especially with gay and lesbian people. 
The way forward demands that churches begin to discuss sexuality in a positive, broader context, and that we see the sexuality as the gift that God intended. While affirming marriage in the nuclear family, we should not make an idol of marriage in the nuclear family. Not everyone is married, and the witness of Scripture is that chastity is as equally blessed a state of life as is marriage. There are cultural trajectories that we have to resist as a matter of consciousness, but we must do so while articulating and embodying a healthy and beautiful dedication to godly sexuality, to love, marriage, friendship, community, and family. We must exercise the discipline to consistently articulate the bigger picture of the gift of our sexuality. It is necessary in doing that that we make moral judgments. But evangelicals have made the mistake of letting moral judgment be the first and dominant thing that they have to say on this issue. We have the opportunity to contextualize our message about sexuality in the broader context of God's redemptive work in all of human life and in the cosmos. When we build a relationship with a gay man or a lesbian woman and introduce him or her to the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity not just or first to tell them that some of their sexual choices are immoral, but rather to recast the entire story of their lives and our lives in the context of God's redemptive work. Our second major failure is that by treating persons who identify as gay or is that of, I'm sorry, our second major failure is that by treating persons who identify as gay or lesbian as irredeemable, we miss the opportunity to honestly confront our own brokenness. We point the finger and we thus break fellowship with those that we push away. The reality is we, you and I, are deeply broken ourselves. Sexual brokenness is not a characterization of those degenerates over there, but of the entire human family. And so the way forward is to reestablish fellowship with the entire human family, recognizing that we together share God's gift of sexuality, and that together we share the burden of brokenness of that gift, a brokenness that can and is being redeemed by God. A couple of specific points on this matter deserve emphasis. You all know that the church has been hurt badly time and again by the revelation of the hypocrisy and moral brokenness of its leaders. Make no mistake about it. One of your primary life callings is to pursue sexual purity and wholeness. It is no mistake that the New Testament apostles time and time again feature the call to sexual purity prominently on their list of the core requirements of faithful discipleship. The apostles were realists. You will never have it right. You will never have it nailed down. The need for brutal honesty and rigorous discipleship will always be there in your pursuit of sexual purity. Also, I want to mention a complex point that I can't unpack fully for you, and that is that we should resist viewing the categories of homosexual and heterosexual as enduring creation realities. We need to instead see them as our human constructions of the complex realities of our lives. It is a real thing that some people engage in same-sex behavior. It is a real thing that some people feel predominant and stable same-sex attraction. But our society constructs these into these definitive categories of the person that we are either gay or straight and thus ignores much of the complexity of our human experience. We should resist using these labels as ways of fundamentally identifying persons. You are not either a heterosexual or a homosexual. You are a person with complex pro proclivities and complex possibilities for choice. Our third major failure has been our clumsy engagement with culture, our embarrassingly deficient representation of the richness of Christian perspectives on human sexuality and of the broader Christian intellectual life. Recent surveys suggest that the majority of the public now sees evangelical Christians as anti-intellectual and hateful. While this perception is in part the creation of a spin machine that pushes terms like extreme and homophobic and generates gro grotesque pseudo-controversies like the recent Chick-fil-A dust-up and the Mark Regneris scandal that is currently going on at the University of Texas, these neg negative evangelical characterizations are not without justification given the way that some of us have, have responded at times. The way forward is to demonstrate love and respect for those whose views differ from our own. We should be quick to listen and slow to speak. We should be circumspect in everything that we say. As someone who engages the scientific literature, I must say that it is often embarrassing how evangelicals handle their engagement with science. 
We need to develop a well-grounded Christian appreciation for the possibility of truth coming through empirical study by believers and by non-believers, even as we recognize the way that science has been used ideologically against the church and its moral stance in the cause of gay advocacy. It is for this very reason that I got into this debate was my outrage at how science was being misused against the church. We need to be literate in science, and we need to ask deep questions. We need to manifest curiosity. We need to explore how we can grow to a deeper and fuller understanding of the complexity of the human condition. Now, in our engagement with culture, we have to recognize and respond to one of the biggest challenges of all. Christians rightly frame questions of homosexual conduct around morality. In response, right now, the world is saying to us, you just don't get it, do you? This is not a question about morality. It is a question about civil rights. And we've largely failed to address the reality that increasingly in the Western world, sexual orientation is treated as the equivalent of race. Sexual identity is presumed to be a fundamental given of our very existence, determined before birth, the bedrock of our identity. This is one area where being literate about the science can help. For instance, many think homosexual orientation is genetically caused, even though the best science says not so fast. The latest and best behavioral genetic study of identical male twins looked at uh, in the Swedish twin registry found 71 identical male twin pairs where at least one of those twins could be identified as gay. How often do you think that the second identical male twin was also gay? What they actually found was that in only seven out of 71 cases was the second identical twin also gay. When it comes to race, I guarantee you 100% of the identical twins were of the same race. <laughs> but only seven out of 71, only 10% of the identical twin pairs matched on sexual orientation. And so clearly the analogy with race breaks down. This identical twin discordance suggests how little we understand about the homosexual condition and how hasty it is to define personal identity around our sexuality. Christians positively assert that our identity is found first in Christ, in membership in the church and in the family of God and in faithful discipleship. Identity is not first and foremost grounded on our sexuality. We have a beautiful and a compelling alternative to offer, and we must not ignore an important reality about construing sexual identity as a civil right, and that is that those who see themselves as sexual, sexual minorities often really have been mistreated. They really have been subject to reprehensible treatment by and in our culture. I cannot endorse gay marriage because I see marriage not as a right, but as a gift and a reality that's created by God. But I do see gay and lesbian persons fully as human beings. They are my brothers and sisters as fellow members of the human family, and they are endowed with the same rights that I enjoy. We should be responsive to correct injustice. We should be grieved at violations of justice. We should support the well-being of those who are different. If we want our religious liberties to be treated with respect, we must, respect, we must treat respectfully those who morally dissent from us. Our fourth major failure is that of our pastoral care for God's people among us. As we have construed gay and lesbian people as the enemies in the culture war, as the irredeemable others, we have pushed our brothers and sisters out of the churches. We can and we must do better. Effective pastoral care begins with learning to talk about sexuality in our churches and to do so in a healthy, biblical, and loving way. Many churches avoid the topic of sexuality like the plague. The reality is that sexuality is a difficult subject. It is a contentious subject that pastors and church leaders too often avoid for fear of offending, for creating schism, for creating misunderstanding. We need to get over that and get on with God's calling of the formation of God's family. Churches need to support comprehensive shaping of sexual character in our young persons. Our primary calling is to love, but love is not subjectively defined. Love for Christians is defined by scripture and requires telling the truth about sexual morality and sexual immorality. As we minister to fellow sojourners, to those who experience sexual brokenness, we must, must not expect or demand easy answers and instant solutions. We should instead walk in fidelity alongside strugglers. 
I urge you to contemplate the difference between cure and care. As instant solution fast food Americans, we yearn for the easy fix. We're sort of implicit Pentecostals of the worst sort who want to believe that Jesus will smite that person and heal them instantaneously and miraculously so they won't be a bother. They and their problems will just go away. I've talked to a lot of people with homosexual backgrounds and the miraculously and totally cured people are pretty hard to find. I know a lot of people, however, who have experienced very significant change in their lives. The most common path is the path of chastity as a single person. I also know people who have shifted away from homosexual attraction to be able to function in a heterosexual relationship, though rarely without complications and challenges. Be ready for a complex ministry of walking alongside your sheep over the long haul. Something like a total cure may occur in the long run for some, but all, every, all of your all of those in your pastorate will require steadfast and tenacious care all along the journey. The final failure. I've seen time and time over again over the last three decades theological conservatives who have been outmatched and outgunned by the political sophistication, the tenacity, and the creativity of those who are pushing a gay affirming agenda. I've been, I was deeply involved for years in the debates in the mainline Episcopal denomination, in the Lutheran denomination, and the PCUSA, the uh, Presbyterian Church of the USA. I've watched those denominations lurch ever more definitively into the full acceptance of sexual practices that are deplored in Scripture. I've seen conservatives outmaneuvered and outworked in the governance of individual churches and in their denominations. And one of the things that we must do is we must examine these topics openly in our churches. Our churches should be structured to create an atmosphere of inquiry and loving examination, but within the boundaries of confessional commitment. If you avoid these issues, you are fostering the eventual capitulation of your church to cultural standards. The progression I've seen in the church is the church that first refuses to address the issue, which then grudgingly allows the airing of non-traditional perspectives, followed by dialogue groups with incompatible views, followed by suspension of commitment to biblical teaching while consensus is sought, to toleration or authorization of minority perspectives with some privileged respect for the traditional view, and finally the full embrace of what was previously completely out of bounds. How will you keep the church that you will lead in the future consistent with biblical standards? Doing so will require that you teach with clarity, that you rigorously screen and develop church leadership, that you lovingly and strategically exercise church discipline, all in humble prayer for the Spirit's work and blessing. Will you have the strength and wisdom to discern where your future elders and deacons are on these issues? Will you have the clarity to insist on biblical fidelity on these matters? Will you have the strength to allow and encourage dialogue and debate, but always from the basis of confessional confidence that God has spoken on these issues and that fidelity to God requires that we stand with the view articulated in Scripture itself? Tim Keller, prominent Christian spokesperson, was right at a recent meeting of the Gospel Coalition when he stated that the issue of sexual orientation and sexual identity are today's most pressing issues of apologetics and about the credibility of the Christian message. I hope that as, a, as representatives of, uh, for, for, I hope that I, as a representative of the passing generation of leaders, that these reflections can challenge you, the rising generation of leaders, and guide you to fidelity in Christ and to Christ to succeed where we have not. I hope that in your churches, people like my DTS graduate friend who was here decades ago will have a very different and a much improved ex experience. Please remember, dear brothers and sisters, that our Lord Jesus Christ said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Our great shepherd also said, feed my sheep. May God equip you to do all that of which he has called you to, and he is a faithful God who will do so if you turn to him. Amen. Well, thank you, Stan. Uh, I want to begin by opening up the question time. I'm going to ask Stan an initial question. What I want you to do, if you have a question for Stan, you see the microphones in the aisles, please come forward and I will recognize you. Please uh, keep your question crisp so we can get through as many questions as possible. We'll go through to our normal chapel time, then I'll take a little break and allow those who want to leave to do so and those who want to hang around for the continued discussion and dialogue around uh, 
uh, around this topic. Uh, we'll be, have extra time. We'll meet for an hour afterwards. So that's where we are. Stan, my first question to you is this. Why is it important to place the issue of homosexuality uh, in the context, in the larger context, of a discussion on sexuality in general? Why should we, why should we attempt to broaden the conversation as opposed to keeping it narrow? I think that's a great question, and uh, I could perhaps go on for 20, 20 minutes or more about that, but I'll try to keep it brief. I think the first reason is substantive. The, the issue of sexuality today, of homosexuality today, is being framed as a civil rights issue. It's being framed as an issue of an irrevocable, deeply rooted personal identity. This is who I am. If you reject this behavior pattern, if you reject my attractions, if you say that this is a form of brokenness and not a form of giftedness, then you are, are rejecting me. And I think the only way to, in, to engage that issue and cut through it at a deeper level is to, is to step back and ask, what is the broader picture of what Christians believe about sexuality? Our sexuality is a gift. It's part of, it's part of God's image by which we are made. It's a, it's a gift to be cherished and loved. It's, a, it's something on, on which we need to have confession for our brokenness and be seeking wholeness. Um, by putting it in a broader perspective, by putting it in a category where it is subsidiary to, to faithful following of Christ, it gives us the opportunity to refocus the conversation. We can't win, so to speak. The point is not to win. The point is faithfulness. But we're not going to be able to be faithful if we engage the, the, the discussion on terms that are alien to Scripture itself, that are alien to the way that God sees us. God sees homosexuality, homosexual conduct, I think, as just one more form of the brokenness that we experience. And so I think reframing the issue is, is really important. I think it's also important for strategic issues. When we frame the issue as homosexuality, then the issue is about them. It's about those people. And I think it's a fundamental, it's a fundamental point of our strategic orientation that in order to engage people in loving dialogue, a dialogue in which I come as a broken person offering the truth about who I am, and I want to have that kind of conversation with them, by framing it more broadly about sexuality, you have the chance to engage, to change the structure of the dialogue and to engage them as people. All right, we will go to the questions on the floor and we'll start over here. Um, all right, I just have a quick question. Um, you said it's about us, and I, I agree with you, it is about us. And so I have a verse here that kind of just makes me think a lot. I just want you to help me understand how we apply this to our communities and reference this homosexuality topic that is such a big topic to talk about. Um, there's 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. Um, you probably know about it. I'll just read it for everyone else here. Um, I wrote you... I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not all mean the sexually immoral of the world, or the greedy of swindlers or adulterers, since then you need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing you to not associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexually immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not to even eat with such one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It's not those who are inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. That's a great question <laughs> and a challenging question. Um, I guess my response is, is to hold that, that passage in, in tension with the example of Christ himself and who associated with sinners was known such that he himself was presumed to be a glutton and a sinner. And uh, he did so for the, re for the uh, exercise of his ministry of love and truthfulness. And uh, so I think, there, I think the focus of this passage, Paul, the broader context of Corinthians, as I understand it, is Paul's exhortation to a church that has allowed itself to be immersed in immorality, has, allowed it, has, has engaged in this kind of Gnostic separation of the body from the spirit, and thus they're, they're allowed to have all kinds of excesses. And he's trying to bring them in, in order, and he's trying to reestablish what the heart of the gospel is. And I think in that context, there is a, t there is a time and uh, there, there's a time when we have to say that a person is really not seeking to follow Christ, but rather is, is 
placing themselves and positioning themselves as a disruptor of the unity of the body and is a false teacher within the body. So there are times, and that, that's what I meant in my, in my talk when I m mentioned the, the loving and thoughtful use of church discipline. There are times when you have to say, you know, we're not going to let you teach anymore. We're not going to let you speak anymore in our, in our passage because you're leaving, leading people astray. But we should come to that point reluctantly. We should come to that point with some degree of patience. And uh, I think Christ would call us into relationships with, uh, with broken people, with sinners. And so I think, I think this passage is not a universal sort of treatment, not to, not to even uh, associate at all with, with sinners, but rather is a strategic um, instruction in the context of a particular church situation. I think the broader moral injunction is to be engaged, but to do so from a position of moral, of confessional stability and moral confidence as we engage people. But that's a great question. Isn't it important in 1 Corinthians 6 that the list is a long list of sinners? In other words, we don't just have one sin mentioned, but we have that's right. several, that's several right. Positions mentioned, several right. actions mentioned. Paul transitions from the very passage that you read um, into 1 Corinthians 6 where he says the wicked will not inherit the earth and he is very clearly trying to exhort people towards holiness and the list is very, very daunting and then he has this amazing declaration after the list, and such were some of you. And so I read those passages and I'm torn. There's a, a controversy right now where there's a Christian leader who's being in a sense rightly questioned because he wants to claim that our moral behavior does not, does not have any impact on our relationship with God. And that seems to me to be quite contrary to scripture. But neither is, is the case that you stumble once and you're out of the kingdom. Somewhere there, there's a, I, I take the Apostle Paul to be teaching that there's a moral consequences to the trajectory we set ourselves upon. And the person who's unrepentantly and persistently pursuing a path of immorality is putting their soul in danger and putting the souls of others in danger. And so those really have to be dealt with carefully. Okay, over here. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for coming out to speak to us on this topic. My question is, where does one find the balance between protecting civil liberties and rights of the LGBT community without compromising Christian beliefs? That's, <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer, but I'm not gonna share it. <laughs> no, that's a, that's, a, that's a terrific question. I think we, I think we really need to go issue by issue and, um, and, and, and try to, to have discernment and recognize that there'll be some points of disagreement within the Christian community as we deal with these issues. I, I think that um, many of you may know that uh, Wheaton College right now is in, a, is in a tough relationship with the federal government because we fi have filed a lawsuit against the federal government because their uh, mandates are coming down that uh, would require us to, to provide as part of our insurance policies abortifacient drugs to, uh, to women as part of contraceptive care. They're lumping drugs that after the fact uh, try to, uh, to uproot the implantation of a fetus in the womb of the mother and, uh, and we regard that as a morally loaded issue. As we discuss that on campus, we're realizing that, you know, that even though we all agree on the sanctity of life, exactly where somebody would parse the issue, for instance, would a person allow for the exception of use of a pill like that in a case of rape? What about traumatic, violent rape? Would, would a person allow that? There's room for moral disagreement, but we, we have to find these, these issues of agreement that we unite around. And so when a, when a gay and lesbian person, I think, um, uh, can't, do, is treated to inequality in housing rights or is, is treated to inequality in the capacity to get and maintain a job. I think that that's a, something that needs to be addressed as a civil rights issue. But marriage is another issue. That's, it, I think we have to ask the fundamental question, is marriage a civil right? And my argument would be, no, it's not. Marriage is a creational reality before God. Marriage is, is the union of one man and one woman for life. Have there been abuses in the life of the church? Absolutely, we see in the Old Testament the depiction of polygamous marriage and adulterous marriages and so forth. So we have the witness of that kind of brokenness. But issue by issue, we need to sort these things out, maintain a witness of love and truthfulness, and uh, recognize injustice for what it is, but also recognize that in the sake of, for the sake of advocacy, uh, there are parts of the gay adv advocacy community that would like to turn every issue into an issue of fundamental civil rights. 
and that's problematic for us as Christians. So is the ordination of the gay pastor, the gay bishop, the gay church uh, authority person, is that an issue of civil rights? Well, if religious institutions don't have the capacity to govern themselves and determine the standards for the, the appointment of leadership, of, of what we hold up as a moral example and what we don't hold up as a moral example, we're really gonna be in trouble. Thank you for a great question. We're here. I studied at Wheaton, and um, I thank you for many of the times that you spoke there as well. Um, I'm glad to see this discussion here. Thank you. Um, my question is kind of on a, it's on a personal level, on a personal scope um, okay. with people that I might interact with and less about larger scope public debates. Um, and the question is something you've referenced before, um, the question of identity and such a strong feeling of um, when I talk to someone who is uh, gay, and they know or they feel that their identity is so wrapped up in their homosexuality and that's what's so important is that you approve who I am and approve what I do and that is the starting point to even being able to talk with me. Um, and I'm not saying that all um, GLBT um, practicing people have that feeling but it is common because I've, I've encountered it a number of times. Um, the first thing they want to know from me is, do you approve of what I do? Right. And I, I mean, if I'm to answer truthfully, um, the question is, what are some practical ideas of how to sidestep that or to represent myself differently as a witness or mm -hmm. to, um, I don't know, just maybe be nice or something? <laughs> so that they don't... I would start with being nice, yeah. That would... <laughs> now, um, I, th that actually is a great question, and there are individuals who, out of, whether it's out of defensiveness or as a sense of, of, uh, of advocacy, position themselves exactly that way, and it's a very, very difficult issue to work through. I think one, one thing is to simply, I think you can say with a, with a sense of honesty, you're asking my moral views, I'll tell you, but I would really like to establish a relationship with you apart from those moral views. I'm not, I'm not setting them aside, I'm not pretending they don't exist, but I would like to, to make a connection with you, one human being to another. We work together. You know, you may be in a work context or, uh, or a school context or something like that. You know, we're in the same major or whatever it happens to be. I would like to have a relationship with you because I, I think, you know, you're, I appreciate the following qualities about you. I think there's also a sense in which if we, we sometimes friendships are, are built around shared tasks. And I, I would like to see the evangelical church more prominent in ministry. Uh, to those who are suffering from HIV AIDS or to those who are suffering homelessness. Um, at Wheaton, there was a wonderful ministry that, uh, that many students in Wheaton student bodies supported that uh, lo worked with, with men who were on the streets selling themselves as street prostitutes. And my own daughter worked with that ministry for several years. She built marvelous relationships with people that she would have never have come across on the streets of Wheaton. But in downtown Chicago, there are these, these individuals. And she learned how to build those relationships through care and through uh, compassion. And so I think that the fundamental when I try to articulate what the most fundamental issue is, I talk about it having two, two major responsibilities that are very difficult to balance and very tr tricky to balance, and that is the responsibility to, to love and the responsibility to tell the truth. And we oftentimes fall in one direction or the other. For some people, love is, is a formless thing. It's simply affection. And for others, others, it's telling the truth, and so you're shaking your finger at people and, in a sense, avoiding a relationship by shaking your finger. The complexity is that part of the truth is love, and love is not formless and void, but rather is structured by biblical truth. We see in the ministry of Christ that Christ oftentimes does not give the people he's engaging what, what they think they want. Instead, he gives them what they really need. And so he oftentimes doesn't answer the direct question, why? Because the, the, the disciples and the people he's around are a asking the wrong question. So he's gonna ask, answer the right question. We've seen the woman caught in adultery, that he doesn't condemn her, he doesn't allow her to be executed, but do, is, he, is he devoid of moral judgment? No, the very last part of the interaction is, go and sin no more. And so he gives her the instruction that she needs, but he does it in a context where he has, he has established a loving relationship of care and protection of her life. And so love is, um, love is something that needs to be structured by our biblical understandings. We, we encounter this as, tr as, as parents all the time. We learn with our young ones that they desperately want that candy, but it's not good for them. It's not loving to give them what they want. 
And so we have to walk that balance where we don't claim to be omniscient. We're not God. God is God. But we have enough of the truth that we have a sense that sometimes what the gay, or gay man or lesbian woman wants is not good for them. Full affirmation, and, full affirmation of exactly how you are in your brokenness and in my brokenness is not what God would call me to do. My love for you needs to be structured by truth. So that's the closest I can get to something wise to say that. So thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to kind of uh, piggyback off of that and, uh, and ask another practical question. Uh, I've been working in a restaurant for the past two years uh, where homosexuality is, is very rampant. And um, I've done a good job of, I guess, tolerating and, and establishing relationships with them. Uh, and I've also tried to witness and talk about uh, theological issues to some extent. And uh, there have been successes and failures. Uh, but a lot of times I have been shut down. And I guess what would be your response uh, to me trying to continue to develop bridges and theological uh, ho hopes of uh, establishing theological dialogue um, with, with that kind of uh, situation? I commend you for being there. Well, one of my children is in the restaurant world, and the restaurant world is one of those sub-communities of the broader community where sexual immorality and drug use and so forth and so on are very, very common, and it's a very can be a very dark place in which to be a witness. And thank God that God places and calls some people into dark places where they can be a, a light. I think it's really, I just want to commend you for your ministry. And uh, one point that I would say is that we sometimes get confused that God's blessing is only expressed in success. But I think all, much more crucially, God's, God's blessing is expressed in faithfulness. You are not called to succeed in your witness. You're called to, to faithfulness in your witness. And the seeds that you're planting may take years, decades to, to bear fruit. And in some cases, they may never bear fruit. But thank God that you're there as, as that witness. I think it's also the case that the gospel is, is truly a stumbling block. It's a scandal for some persons, and it will necessarily remain that way. The world will hate us because they hated Christ. And uh, so you can plant those seeds by Christian integrity as you, as you try to engage those relationships and show that you can express non-erotic non bonds of affection, love, loyalty, interest, engagement with these individuals, that you can remain faithful to your calling um, I think that's the best witness you can. And you, it, that balance you're talking about, about being caring and also bringing up the theological issues, is, it sounds to me like a very, very useful and balanced way to approach it. So I, I'm not sure I can do any more than commend you for that. So thank you. Okay, our time for chapel is up. So I want to thank Dr. Jones for being here, first of all. Thank you.